somebody and to answer the phone. I felt a real sense of urgency. So I called MCC, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Community, Community Church, right. because I knew they served gay and lesbian people, and I wanted a lesbian to come in and become our secretary. You So you, you wanted the secretary to be a lesbian? Oh, yes. Heavens, yes. Okay. Okay. Because after all, we were a lesbian law firm. I was in my separatist uh, state of affairs and didn't want to work with men. So we wanted a lesbian. So I called MCC and I said, have you got a lesbian there, a woman who can work for us as a legal secretary? And they said, we have the woman for you. She is the best legal secretary in the state. She is terrific. And she's looking for a job. So I said, oh, that's marvelous. Send her over. And they said, now, there's just one problem. She's TS. And I thought, TS? That's okay. I mean, there's MS and there's MD and there's TS. And so but I MS, said, multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis. So you thought it was a physical. Di dystrophy. So, so you thought TS meant a physical disability of some kind. I knew you were ill of some sort. Right. So I said to the pastor, I said, that's okay. We don't discriminate on the basis of disabilities. Send her right on over. So in my memory, in comes Paula. I am four feet 11. Paula is six feet one and a six half. Six feet one and a half. I'm a little bitty thing, sort of. I'm bigger than I was. And Paula was this enormous woman. And I looked at her and I, I said, Janet, I want to talk to you for a minute. And we went in the other room and I said, Janet, what is TS? And she said, TS is transsexual. And I hit the ceiling. I said, we are not hiring a man. I will not work with a man in this law firm. This is a lesbian law firm. And she said, this isn't a man. This is a transsexual. This is a woman. This is Paula Nielsen. I said, no, it isn't. She was born a man, always a man. I won't work with a man. <laughs> And we had this struggle, and finally Janet said to me, we do not discriminate, she is a woman, and if you won't work with a transsexual, then I won't work with you. Your, your partner in the law firm and your yes. lover in your personal life laid yes. down that ultimatum. And this was our first day hoping in the law firm. So I, I hooked up my overalls and stomped my boots and said, all right, I'll work with her for a little while, but, but you know, we'll just do it on a sort of a trial basis. And I got to tell you, Paula, you changed me. I unlearned my homophobia about transsexuals from you. Darcel 15 is a nightclub here in Portland, Oregon. Darcel started it over 40 years ago, bought a little skid row tavern in the old town section of Portland called Dima's Tavern, and over the years it has evolved into a glamorous cabaret nightclub featuring talented female impersonators where I got over 10 to 12 years of show business training. Darcel and Roxy are partners when when Roxy and Darcel met, Roxy comes from an extensive show business background in Las Vegas, Nevada, as a choreographer, training showgirls for the big shows shows in Las Vegas. And I met Darcel and Roxy at a club where I was entertaining, doing some Sophie Tucker things. Oh, I know that I'm no glamour gal, no motion picture beauty. I've had 30 years of service, hun, and I'm still on active duty. We met you, really saw you work very, very hard, was at, in, at Wild Oscars in a little bar right. uptown. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I, I suppose now your image of Sister Paul is gone. Well, she worked in a little bar up the street, and it was called Wild Oscars. Wild Oscars, Wild Oscars. Right. Wild And Roxy Oscars. and I saw you hit the stage, and there wasn't a stage. It was a dance floor, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And it was like we were... We were here. You were here. I mean, it was it was such a yeah, small place. Yeah, I remember place. that. And you did your routine, and we fell in love. The Sophie Tucker, the no, with you, not Sophie Tucker. No, no, no. I knew that, but I was I doing the Sophie Tucker routine. Okay, yeah. I know that. Yeah, we fell in love with you doing you the doing Sophie, Sophie Tucker routine Tucker. because you didn't. You were nonstop. First of all, I couldn't believe that there was someone around who remembered Sophie Tucker, <laughs> let alone do all yeah. of her material 
for two and a half for three hours. Every single word was every correct word. from the from her recordings. Yeah, mm -hmm. Every word. From her recordings. And so I was impressed, and that's when I said, "Oh, we've got to have Sister Paula do a guest spot and come absolutely, down in our show." Absolutely. Absolutely. I really wasn't. They weren't, weren't calling me Sister Paula then. No, they weren't. No. That came no, later. Did, were, right. Was it Paula then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Paula? I've lived as Paula since yeah. 1963. Oh, that's okay. been my so, identity. Okay, yeah. so it was. But that's right. We, you weren't Sister Paula. Yeah, then. Sister Paula came in 1980 when I was in Eugene. Somebody started but calling you, me that. But you've oh, threatened yeah. me over the years if I didn't call you Sister Paula. So I can't help but even take it back that far, even when you were Sister. When you're when you're just Paula, you've threatened me. <laughs> oh, really? I don't remember well, she, that. Well, a Christian woman shouldn't threat people. Don't you better call me Sister Paula? <laughs> it's in good fun you did. Oh, okay. Uh, no, that was, you're getting very serious. And then every then she got so she was hearing new stories and new stuff, and she could interject, uh, switch on and off out of her Sophie Tucker monologues to uh, uh, on her own own material. The time came that we needed someone who could write legal letters for us because we neither one of us were could write. I can compose a pretty good letter, but nothing like. Paula had, was able to do that made it sound like it come right out of an attorney's mouth and was so good at that. So we hired her to come in and do some office work. Maybe she could actually handle some of our finances and our banking for us uh, if we put her in charge. So we tried that for a minute and I watched her and helping her along and, and uh, as it turned out I thought Paula's even going to be better at this than I am and uh, and she was she was very good pretty soon she was almost literally running our club for a while. I went to see Paula and I especially liked when Paula did uh, dressed up as Shirley Temple. <laughs> it's so cute. Yeah uh, we, we went down to what Few different times to ourselves. But Waylon Flowers and Madam was appearing at the Comedy Connection or something like that, another nightclub in the same area, and came down and saw our show on a Tuesday night and was in the audience. And then we all had our picture taken with um, Waylon Flowers and Madam. And when uh, Madam, you know, the puppet or whatever, looked at me, Madam looked at me and said, Nice tits. <laughs> Dear Christine Jorgensen, she was very good friends of Darcel and Roxy's and stayed at their house whenever she came to Portland. But I it was booked that weekend that Christine was here and um, to do my 45th birthday show. And I did the Sophie Tucker stuff, and so I, that was when I met Christine personally. And I remember the first thing she said to me was, she's sitting there in the booth at Darcell's, oh, you're the one that does the Sophie Tucker bit. And she says, I'm looking forward to hearing it, blah, blah, blah. But whenever I would start talking to her about how she was such an inspiration to me when I was young, you know, and, and first heard of her story, she kind of shut that off. Like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, and she... Um, she really didn't like that when people said that to her. And for whatever reason, I don't know, but Roxy told me later that Christine didn't like transsexuals. And that believe it or not, there are some transsexuals who don't like other transsexuals and whatever, you know. And then Christine's story came along that she gave a lot of hope and inspiration to a lot of people to go ahead and be themselves. Even though she really didn't like to hear that, you know, but nonetheless, um, it was true. But it was a very important part of my life on my 45th birthday to have Christine herself in the audience when I did my birthday show.
ourselves in the club in the daytime, reading the paper, and I came to the page of the reunions, and I saw Gresham Union High School. It just stood right out to me in the page, class of 56, and I thought, ah, that's me. I called Darcelle up at the house. She was at home, and I just said, they, I just said, I saw the notice of my 30th high school reunion, and I'm going to go there and perform there. I just knew it. I, you know, like I said, I never even look at those those announcements, and that one just jumped right out at me, and um, and that that really turned out to be a real turning point in a, in more ways than one. Am I on? Hi, I'm Paula, although I was known as Larry in 1956, Paula Nielsen, and it's wonderful to be here. I rarely make these kind of appearances. <laughs> and yes, I stood out like a sore thumb. When it came time for me to entertain at the reunion, I started out with a comedy cabaret act. Red Hot Mom, Red Hot Mom, but I had to turn the damper down. Now, with the exception of a few people who reacted, I got a lot of cold, icy stares. After about seven minutes into my nightclub routine, I felt I had made a mistake. By this time, however, it was too late. I had to go through with it. However, before I walked off the floor that night at the Red Lion in Jansen Beach, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon me. And so I threw out my pre-planned comedy routine and just opened my mouth and let the Holy Spirit fill it. There may be times of loneliness. There may be times when you feel so totally alone that not one person understands where you're coming from. I've been there time and time again. I've been there. I've been crushed, maybe not physically in an accident, but emotionally, the psyche, the core of my being has been crushed. But I always felt the awareness of an inner presence, an inner strength, an inner power. I don't care what you call it, it doesn't matter. Some people call it the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what I call it. The concept of my becoming a drag evangelist was born. But where did I get the idea of doing the Sister Paula public access ministry? It was to a very dear longtime friend of mine, a spirit-baptized Pentecostal lesbian evangelist who came into Darcell's in the uh, 80s where I was working as an entertainer. And as I said in that nightclub, the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to invite these people into your church as well as any of the other people out there. And so uh, time went by and I started pastoring a church here in Portland and we started uh, a television program called Fellowship and Soul. Yes. Well, I was sitting putting that little program together one day when the Lord spoke to me and he said, you get up and you go down to Dara Cells now. But during this time, Paula was there and they were making dresses and different things. Yeah. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord moved on me again and said, you need to speak to Paula because I've called her in the ministry. And so I began to speak to Paula about her call. And you did not know this until the Lord spoke that no, to you. No, I right? didn't know anything about that. So at any rate, I did not know there was such a thing as public access television until in December of 86, in 1986, I was a guest on Sister Naomi's public access program. You know, you have a call of the ministry on your heart. It's been there uh, since you were a youth. And now God is beginning to once again kind of stir this within you to begin to really minister in even a greater fashion than you've been ministering. Because I really believe that the world needs to know that the Lord is living inside you. Yes. And on the way home, Pastor Naomi told me that I could produce a program of my own on public access television. And so one year later, in December of 1987, the Sister Paula television show was created. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're starting a series of new shows, a new type of tele-evangelism. 
In this day and age with PTL and Jim and Tammy, television evangelism is quite the popular thing in the Christian world. I am Paula, I am a transsexual, and I suppose you would say a member of a minority group, and as far as I know, a minority that has never preached the gospel before in this particular role. Don't turn me off now. Don't sit and think, oh, this is odd. He looks at the club when I was doing the Monday, Tuesday night show, and it was still just called Changing the Image. There's only about three or four segments that have been aired by that. A woman right in the front row, I said to her husband, that's Sister Paula. <laughs> and Darcel, people are always getting me and Darcel mixed up, and after the second or third show, Darcel and Roxy were going out of their house to get into the car to come down to the club, and the next door neighbor said across the driveway, um, we, hey, Darcel, we saw you last night on TV preaching all that shit. <laughs> Paula Nielsen is a he that dresses as a she. Paula Nielsen bills herself as Sister Paula. She's not a nun, and she's not an ordained minister. She's a televangelist, and as David Gillen reports, Sister Paula is one of the most unusual people you're going to see on your TV. Televangelists like Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart have shocked America. I have sinned against you, my Lord. But old-time religion ain't seen nothing yet. Meet Sister Paula, America's only drag evangelist. Yes, this sister is a mister. Well, say whatever you like about her lifestyle. You certainly can't fault her dedication and sincerity, I don't think. Sister Paula is quite ambitious. She hopes to take her program nationwide. See, when I started on my television ministry, it didn't take long for the word to get out. And um, I, was, uh, I wasn't even on the air on just, this was just local public access for a year before I w was on some, you know, as a guest on some national shows. You know who Fred Willard is? I've heard the name, but I don't really know who he is. Today's guest on our show, I'm real nervous about it, and I'm excited about it, because for the first time in this ministry, we have a national television celebrity on our show, Fred Willard, who is known for such shows as Fernwood Tonight and the DC Follies. What we're doing now is um, a show called Access America. Yes. And to my surprise, around the country, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of shows like yours, which mm -hmm. are public access shows. Yes. And the producer called me and he said, um, we'd like you to host this show and come on up and look at some of the tapes. And you're going to mm -hmm. go around the country and appear on a few of them. So mm -hmm. I, I was really knocked out when I saw what were some of the tapes. And yours, this is the first week we've gone out, and yours mm -hmm. is one of the first seven we've chosen to be on. What type of shows are, are um, coming up through the level of cable access that are out of the ordinary that people can't get on national television? A lot of shows are very funny. People are putting mm -hmm. on uh, their own type of uh, comedy shows. And it's kind of an offbeat comedy, a mm -hmm. type of comedy that isn't censored, that there's no network executive looking exactly. over their shoulder saying, no, you, you can't do that or you can't do this. And so there's no religious bigots that are tr controlling that at this point in time. No, no. Which like is they're trying to control on the major networks. Yes. Now, before the show, you were talking about uh, wanting to go on a little more major mm -hmm. exposure. Do you feel you would get any kind of resistance from uh, people like that if you were... I, I'm sure, television? yeah, if, if, if this particular ministry went on a national level and became nationally successful, I'm sure that there would be opposition from this. There's this one women's evangelical fundamentalist group that's head, headed by Beverly LaHaye that are always sending out literature in the mail opposing shows that have any kind of subject of gay content uh -huh. on it. And then there's another, some kind of a Christian family association from the South that's headed by a man named Donald Wildman. Yes. And see, I'm on the mailing list for all of these various religious publications. You know, if this show, if we each had cue cards, mine would be very small and yours yeah, would be very big. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Yeah. You know, they said you're going to have trouble getting Sister Paula to talk, draw her out of her shell. Suppose Johnny Carson's people 
people called you tomorrow and said, Johnny's not yeah. going to be here. Jay Leno dropped out. Uh -huh. You got one show. You can have three guests. Anyone you'd like on the show, we'll get them for you. If I was Who would you pick? Oh, that's wonderful. If yeah. I was going to pinch in for Johnny Carson. And they said, get anyone you any, want. Th any three guests that I want. Tammy Faye Baker would be the first one I'd ask. Okay. Tammy Faye and I together would be national news. <laughs> and Fred Willard was wonderful. So I'm writing about that now, but that kind of was the breaking point. After that, I started getting invitations to be in all kinds of things. You've been doing the Sister Paula show now for nearly three years. Who actually watches it? That's the thing that is sensational about it that just blows me away. When I first started the Sister Paula ministry, the first time an open transsexual or a drag queen preaching the gospel, I had no idea how the public was going to react to it. But I've been on the air now for almost three years, and I have people of all walks of life that watch my ministry regularly. I have church people, evangelicals, Pentecostals who watch me, the charismatic folk, and also the non-church world is watching. I have gay people and straight people, people of all walks of life that they, they come across me, you know, when they're flicking through the various cable channels, and at first, of course, what they look at stops them, but then they <laughs> stop and they listen to what I have to say. And a good percentage of these people that I pick up, the channel clickers, you know, I pick them up as regular fans. Sister Paula, don't some people think your show's a spoof? Yes, uh, they do at first until they watch it. You know, just recently I was, um, I had Fred Willard, who is a national television host here in America, and um, when he was interviewed by the press here after he and I taped the show together, he said that when he heard about me and about the quote drag evangelist and all that, he thought it was just a put on. But once he worked on the show with me, he realized that I was dead serious about my religious commitment and my spiritual experience. And he even said that I reminded him of his aunt. Just to clear up any confusion. Then in 1992, People Magazine did a big thing on public access. They featured four public access shows of, of all the thousands of the country, and mine was one of them. And uh, at the time, Darcel said, boy, she said, I would pay them to put me in People Magazine. You know, and then, then one of the waiters told me that Roxy said during that time, didn't say it to me, but it, Roxy said, Darcel and I wish we were getting just half the publicity that Paula Nielsen's getting. What about your family? What do they think of all this? My mother accepts it completely. My father I have not seen since 1960. He uh, wrote me a letter not too long ago. Our first contact in 30 years said, I don't know anyone by the name of Sister Paula. I used to have a nice boy named Larry, but I don't know what ever <laughs> happened to him. And I wrote back and said, well, you never treated me like you thought I was a, quote, nice boy back then. My father was a longshoreman. He always called me a sissy when I grew up and put me down because I just naturally like to do the things that girls like to do in my grown up years. Right. My mother thought it was just terrible that anybody would disown their own child like that. Yeah. And uh, she feels that, you know, it's, and it's true with parental love, that p parents you, uh, usually stand by their children regardless. People and stand by their children when they've murdered people. Exactly. Being that you had this feeling towards him, when he died, did you have an effect, or was it really almost no. like you, had, you, you got the information that he died, and then you just went on with your day? Right, yeah, I did, yeah, but pretty much. And uh, my cousin Judy, who is my um, father's sister's daughter, you know, on my father's side of the family, called and told me about it. And I really, um, I, I didn't care. I don't know. I didn't feel it much of anything. It's hard to explain. I, um, um, and I remember a friend of mine said, "Come on, they, uh, Paula, that's got to pinch a nerve somehow." But it may have a little bit. And I thought of memories of him. And um, but a reconciliation between him and, I, him and I was just not going to happen. It wasn't realistic. However, I kind of wish now if I had it to do over again, I would have tried to move into a direction and brought more reconciliation. I have forgiven him now. You can forgive somebody after they're passed on because forgiveness has to do with you. And he and my stepmother were buried together, you know, in the same grave. Paula and I had, uh, both of us too, had a love-hate relationship. 
uh, with each other sometimes. I'd fall so in love with her and I'd find her the most wonderful, fabulous person to be around and I love talking to her. And by gosh, sometimes the next time I'd see her, and particularly when she's working with us, she and I would have knocked down, drag out, screaming matches to the point that both of us would lose our, crack our voices and lose our voices from yelling and screaming at each other. She's alone all the time, most of the time. So she doesn't have anyone to talk to or anyone to vent to. And so she doesn't, when she doesn't talk a lot, that's when these things start building up inside of her and she lets her imagination run away with her and they, so she, these things that aren't that much become monumentous as it were. And, uh, and then by the time she gets it monumentous, then she erupts like a volcano and just exactly like a volcano. Well, I'm kind of fiery myself sometimes like that. So when our volcanoes would go off at the same time, it was one <laughs> big thing. When I first started working at Dara Sales, people that knew her knew me. They predicted it wouldn't last at all, you know, and because we were too much, you know, alike. You know, I mean, in some ways, you know, strong two egos. <laughs> and but we we did last for over ten years. But ooh, there were some bumpy roads bumpy rocks on the way and uh, oh dear there would became a parting of the ways and uh, then uh, anyway yeah that was the whole thing that there was just personal problems personal stuff that they that we couldn't work anymore with Paula and I still loved Paula uh, Darcel still loved Paula and we still do you know, and Naomi was encouraging me to break away from there and go out and the preachers and evangelists instead. But the thing of it is, you have to make a living. And I was making, you know, um, to go out and, and preach in these little churches, you know, there was no money in it. And I mean, you know, I had I had to make a living. And um, But no, I did think about moving on from there. And then Darcel and I had the falling out in 1990 into there. And that's when I did the volunteer work. I'm, the only reason I survived then, after Darcel and I had the falling out leaving, was because I was doing volunteer work five days a week at the HIV Day Center as a receptionist, and I got my, my meals. You know, the volunteers all got to eat and all of that. I did the, I, my total time in AIDS ministry was about eight to ten years, all told, delivering meals to people's homes, working in the hospices and the HIV Day Center. I had some of my most powerful, meaningful spiritual experiences in that area of ministry than I've had anywhere else in my life. My special guest today is with the Names Project, the AIDS Quilt. James Bryson, who's involved in the Portland chapter of the Names Quilt, is with me today. How long have you been involved with the the Names Project? I've been involved with the Names Project since the show that was here in Portland last summer. Yes, when the when the quilt came. Yes. And I noticed you have a T-shirt. Remember their names. So how did you get involved with the Names Project? I got involved through a friend of mine who mm -hmm. died several years ago from AIDS. Mm -hmm. And when he died, the grief process, I wasn't able to put to rest. Mm -hmm. I had a friend um, a couple of years ago who died from AIDS who um, wanted to reach, you know, his 30th birthday and didn't quite fell short of about three months, you know, of reaching mm -hmm. his 30th birthday. So Esther Hoffman Howard, who Esther's pantry is named after today, was one of the early, early ones that died from AIDS uh, that was well known in the community. But then after we lost, we lost first Myra, and then her lover a few years later died from AIDS, Ray Barrett, and also um, Car Carl, who was the head waiter, whom we called the Carlotta. My friend Terry, who was was at the House of Light, which was an AIDS um, hospice, residential care facility. If there's uh, anything that makes me mad is to hear an evangelical, anti-gay bigot blame AIDS on the gay people. That is a lie right out of the pit of hell. Here are the hard, cold facts. Evangelicals who call themselves born-again Christians have waged a war against civil rights for gays and lesbians, and nearly one million dollars is being spent 
on this anti-gay ballot measure created by evangelical born-again Christians. That's right. One million dollars that is needed desperately for medical research to find a cure for AIDS. And these evangelists that attacked people with AIDS and said that AIDS is God's judgment are going to have to stand before God someday and give an account for the damage that they did. And I wouldn't want to be in their shoes, believe me. The only one back in the early days of the AIDS epidemic of the big name evangelical preachers that supported people with AIDS was Tammy Faye Baker. Here we are in West Hollywood. I am Paula Nielsen here with my friend Michael. In 1994, I attended a church conference in Houston, Texas. And when I got there, it was pouring down rain. And it was the great Texas flood of 1994. And we spent the night at this new Caney Middle School, which was an evacuation shelter for those who were victims of the flood. And there were scores of people sleeping on the floor. And Tom Hirsch, who was the head of Advanced Christian Ministries sponsoring it, you know, he was really nervous about all that. And he was nervous about me being there right in the middle of Ku Klux Klan redneck country, you know. Right. The Red Cross nurse came up and said to Tom, is this a gay group? And he just froze. He says, I thought, oh, God, help us, no. And so he said, well, yes, it is. And the Red Cross nurse said to him, well, good. She says, I'm gay, too. Uh -huh. And, of course, he just breathed a sigh yeah. of relief, you know. Oh, yeah. I met two gay men who had a public access television ministry in Los Angeles. And from that, I ended up for about four years of doing my own public access television ministry in West Hollywood, in uh, Santa Monica, and in Hollywood. This is Strange Universe, the phenomenal daily news magazine. The Trans Evangelist. We met Sister Paula when she came to Los Angeles to tape a special version of her show. Here we are in West Hollywood one more time. Right now, oh, this is so, so exciting. She also took the opportunity to walk down one of the most famous streets in the world, Hollywood Boulevard's Walk of Fame. What do you think about Hollywood, though? I mean, there's a lot of, would you say that this is sort of sin city? No, I think it's a fun city. We left Sister Paula at the airport, heading home to Portland. She was quite a sight, six foot one and more in heels. Yes, people stared, but she didn't seem to notice. Sister Paula is used to the attention. I um, took an early retirement on Social Security in the year 2000, when I turned 62, and then was working for uh, two days a week to supplement the Social Security. Anyway, and then the late 19, around 1999, 2000, I started listening to television preachers on Trinity Broadcasting. And there were three preachers that I started watching regularly, John Hagee, Joyce Meyer and Joel Osteen, and that brought up that hunger to go to a Pentecostal charismatic church. I decided to go to New Beginnings Christian Center in Portland. I went there on the date of September the 11th, 2001. I didn't say anything about who I was, but people recognized me. Oh, one man said to me the second time I went there, you're Sister Paula, aren't you? They've seen me on television. And I was lasted there about six months. And I was called into one of the staff minister's office and at any rate was told that they wanted me to get delivered from being Paula. And they wanted to, he said, let us lay hands on you, he said to me, and cast that spirit out of you, those are his words, as if it was some kind of a homosexual spirit. And then he said that would be a tremendous testimony. They would put it out there with me being delivered from transsexuality and going back to living the other way, he said, this will be proof that God can, that people can, you would be putting the message out, he said to me, proving that people can be delivered from this. There was kind of, not much, 
but a little bit of a temptation. But because then I thought, oh, I would have acceptance in these circles and all of these people would follow me. And I could probably, and the enemy, the devil whispered into my ear in the temptation part of it and said, you could probably even get a spot on Trinity Broadcasting on the global worldwide satellite television and proclaim your ministry of being delivered and being restored to being Larry and all of that and putting that out that people can be delivered from transsexuality. <laughs> Very often when things happen like this, um, dealing with the gay issues or even going back to dealing with uh, issues of, um, uh, of race or blacks or whatever, um, we, we have the wrong agenda, I think. And very often the agenda is changing a person's belief or changing a person's opinion. And if a That's person believes does. that God thinks that way, if a person believes that God is directing them to do something, you will be utterly out of your mind to expect that they're going to do something different. Anyway, Friday, February 25th started out as any other day, although surprisingly enough, the thought entered my mind when I was getting ready that day, what if this was my last day on earth or something to that effect, and I just put it right out of my mind. You know, I remember getting off of a bus, and then the, the next thing I remember after that, was being in the emergency room in the hospital and I could see the nurses all around there. I had no idea what had happened. I had suddenly, without notice or any kind of warning, I collapsed on the street. My heart stopped beating. I, it's unbelievable. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I remember us rushing to, going over to the hospital and how frightened we were. And I, I saw Paul, Paula was laying there, they had her on ice, kind of cooled down her body, and I, I went there and I, I prayed a lot because I, I was afraid Paula wasn't going to make it. It looked really bad, and that was so, uh, you, you don't realize how much you care for someone deeply until something like that happens and you think you're going to lose them. I do remember taking the uh, coming in with the pills and throwing them across the room or something or something like that. I, I don't know if I threw them across the room or not. And I do remember reaching up and seeing cords and wires and I was pulling at them. But that's just a split. But, but other than that, I lost my memory. And Mom went with me and I remember how popular Paula was because people would come up and people would call and the nurses were getting lots of calls and stuff. So. Yeah, she had a lot of friends, a lot more friends than I had, that's for sure, <laughs> yeah. And we were there almost every other day uh, for her and uh, hoping that she would come out when she was, in a, she was in that coma for, I think, five or six days or something like that, six days. And we were there every other day, but she don't, doesn't remember that and doesn't know because she wasn't all quite coherent. I get up as I always do every morning. Mm -hmm. I go look at my email. And uh, my God, um, the way I found out was immediately Dave Dishman, a member of Metropolitan Community right. Church here, within them taking you to the hospital within 15 minutes, had emailed me that quick. It was incredible how fast that I got could, out. I could not believe that it. That was incredible. Then I started calling people like uh, Darnell, leaving a message on, then someone else sent me an email saying, I will be the one that's sending out the information on Paula. And mm -hmm. I wrote back that person and said, keep it coming. I want to know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the minute they got you out of um, intensive care, mm -hmm. I sent you flowers. Then. Yes, they told and you me, do not, me. And I called you because mm -hmm. I wanted to have prayer with you. I was very concerned. Yes, I, that meant a lot And they to told me, me that you were very sick. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was telling me that. And But I had to wait until after you got out of intensive care. So I kept waiting. And that worried me more. I really prayed. Because uh, you were in there quite a few days. And yeah, I was. Really, uh, I was lost a whole week's time from the time I collapsed on the street until yeah. I came out of the surgery. Well, everybody told me you weren't going to make it. Yeah, that they, was they were. It was out. kind of iffy They there. were convinced, and they said, she's, this is it. She's not going to make it. Yeah, my mother thought said, that, well, too. I said, well, I said, you know, God's a good God, and God may not be through with Paula yet. So nothing, no, I, you don't remember any, any event right. around that or, or no, something odd very happening? Little. Yeah, I didn't have any, see any long tunnels with the light at the end of it or any of that kind of stuff. And But how did it change you though, or did it? Did it have? It did, it, it did. The, the experience 
it did change me. I don't know. I can't explain it, but I, it did change me. I have a different outlook and an attitude on a lot of things now that I did not have before. And when we uh, the first time that um, we filmed the television show after I, you know, came out of the hospital and the nursing home and all that, and um, and then I watched the playback of it. There's there was a certain si a spiritual sense around the shows and my preaching that. I can't explain it, that wasn't there before I had that experience. And of course, um, it made me appreciate, um, every day I thank God I'm still alive and I'm walking around. But I've got wonderful news this coming Friday, May the 3rd, the Metropolitan Community Church here is helping me celebrate my 50th year as Paul. I was 25 years old then. My biological birthday, I'll be 75 in July. But uh, Metropolitan Community Church here is helping me celebrate that and have macaroni and cheese because that's my favorite that's comfort you food. That's and, and a book signing and all that kind of stuff. There are seven dead cases that are covered in my autobiography, and it's my story exactly as I remember it, and I pray that you'll get a copy of the book. I bought some books, and I don't want to have to lug them all home. <laughs> but, hey, and um, if you're a little short on money, let me know we'll work something out, because I do want you to read my story. I wonder about these uh, affirming or open and accepting churches. Um, has the ideology inside of these churches changed to the point that they think that God is completely okay with homosexual relationships? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they have. The church that I'm a member of, the you know, uh, Congregation of the United Church of Christ, is like that. And finally, I found the church which is open, welcoming, and affirming which accepts people of all sexual orientations. And the neat thing of it is, now that I'm in this wonderful historic church, which is the part of the, found, of the literal fi founding of my own hometown where I was born, where they're open and affirming, I don't hide anything, my transsexuality or anything, I'm able to sing in the choir and sing bass. And I run. a funeral yes yeah and a, memor a memorial service I want the memorial service to really speak and represent who I am and where I'm coming from and but the thing of it is I you know I have don't know where the money's gonna come from for the gravesite thing you know there's there where my my uh, where my aunt and where an aunt and uncle and my grandmother and my aunt Margie are buried I want to be laid to rest with them and there is space there and uh, so I guess that will all work out you know on um, at 1 40 in the morning on Tuesday morning February the 1st my mother who was 91 years old um, passed away and, and she was in a hospice you know facility but there's one thing the reason I mentioned this is this client that I want to get your feedback on I have heard from several people that the, when somebody passes on that the last thing to break down is the hearing in other words after they pass on they still hear for a while and some say that their spirit still lingers around for a, a while i've heard that over the years i've read it and heard it from different sources so what what is your take have you ever heard any of this before what is your take on it i have never heard of any of it before uh oh. however it's not shocking to me at all like you know sister paula we live in a world where we think that we know things and we think that we're so highly evolved and we think that we have the answers. But the reality is, if you compare the things that we know to the possibilities of what's out there to know, it, we don't know anything at all. But somebody asked me at the church, just um, at our lectionary reflections a week or so ago, he said, I'm gonna ask you a hard question. He says, where do we go after we die? I said, well, I, I can tell you what I have been taught in my fundamentalist background as to where we go when we die. But when it comes right down to it, if I'm gonna be honest, I don't know.
I really, I really, I, I, there's all these different religions that have all these different teachings of what happens to us after death, and they all think they're right and everybody else is wrong. And I think the, 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 the real pure truth is that nobody really knows what happens to us after we die until they do it. Uh, if there is such a place called hell, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm not going there. Even though some people disagree with me on that. You know, us old barnstorming, circuit riding, Pentecostal preachers, we just go right up to the time we take our last breath and God calls us home. And then the ministry keeps going after that. But at any rate, and um, someday we're going to take our last breath. Naomi and I both have been there pretty close to it, but God wasn't through with our ministries yet. And this song talks about the future that the one who puts his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has to look forward to. Our future is secure, yes. and it goes like this. Ah, uh, I get the right key. Uh, I am going to a city where the streets of gold are laid, where the tree of life is blue.